involved in what they're doing. And as far as you men that may not be involved in uh, uh, missions or, or, uh, or just a uh, accountability group, uh, the Polygons, our new name, the new Polygons, uh, we met officially last night for the first time as the Polygons. And we had a great meeting. Yes, it was. Good meeting. Uh, so it was more about accountability, you know, about some of the areas to where us men are stressed at. And, uh, you know, I mean, if, if, it, if you got kids or you got wives or you got grandkids, you need to be in our meeting. Uh, yeah, because we definitely going to support you and love on you and pray for you because if you got any of those persons in your life, you need support group. Amen. Okay. What'd you say? <laughs> uh, well, good evening, guys. Good to see all of you. We're glad that you're with us tonight. Great meal. Amen. Yep. Amen. Uh, the only problem with coming to Wednesday night Bible study is when we come and we eat like that, everybody wants a nap. That's right. So, you know, then it's up to Chris to keep you all awake. So and I'm tired this week. So, Chris, it's up to you <laughs> oh boy. to keep this group awake. Uh, we are going to uh, finish up. Uh, with one of our studies tonight, and we might be able to start another. I don't know if, it just depends on Chris. Uh, but we'll be finishing up the book of Micah tonight, one of the, uh, if, uh, one of the minor prophets. So if uh, you want to go ahead and be finding your place in the book of Micah, uh, we'll start out in around chapter 6 there, and we'll, we'll finish up. But in the process of that, uh, while you're looking it up, any announcements tonight that we need to mention? Do uh, keep in mind that uh, uh, Miss Teresa Thomas passed away last night. Uh, we just uh, remember that family in your prayers. Uh, also remember uh, Lisa Wilson's family. Uh, Y'all remember Wayne O. Wayne passed away several years ago, but his mom passed away this weekend, and that service was today as well. So, so remember uh, the Wilson family uh, in your prayers as well. Remember all of our shut-ins. Remember Miss Sandy. Uh, Sandy, for those of you that might not know, she's back in the hospital. She might get to come home today, don't know, but she got admitted yesterday, so... So y'all remember her. Uh, we have several shut-ins, several people that's recovering, recouping. Continue to remember Val and Patty. Um, do also put on your prayer list, uh, George Posey will be having um, a pacemaker put in, and uh, that'll be next week. So, so keep that in your th thoughts as well. Barbie baby is doing good. They're home. Oh, they already have the baby at home. Yeah, yes. yeah. <clears throat> I haven't heard anything since Sunday. Yeah, so so they're they're home, and so um, <laughs> praise the Lord for those those prayer con concerns. Um, any others? Remember Corey. This new dad experience is getting to him. Ain't that right, Ty? <laughs> <laughs> Remember Ashley yeah, too. Remember Ashley. Yeah, okay. And baby Stetson. Baby Stetson. Okay. Yes. I'm going to repeat this because I know people can't hear you especially online, but uh, Jonathan Smith just mentioned uh, their work family uh, in the health department field there. You may have saw it on the news, a lady over in Lauderdale County, I think it was, 
Franklin County. Franklin County, she was uh, killed by some dogs. So remember Jonathan's work family and the family of, of her as well. I saw it last night on the news after we, after we talked about it. Yeah, so it's tragic. It's tragic. Yeah. Others? What do you say? Miss Aiken. Yes, Miss Aiken. Continue to remember Miss Aiken. Remember L2R, Lisa Robinson. She has bumped her bottom and she needs some prayers. Okay, amen. I can't hear nothing. He Why said he'll I be hear? happy to show you the video. It's online. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Uh, any others? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening thanking you for a beautiful day. Thanking you for life itself because we know that you have given us this day that we might rejoice in it and give you praise and glory for it because every moment of time is a gift to us and we're grateful. Thank you for each and every family that is represented here this evening. Uh, thank you, dear Lord, for uh, those children and youth and those workers who have gone across the way. Thank you for our, uh, uh, our kitchen faculty there and, and just a, a great meal tonight. And we do pray that you'll, you'll bless that for the nursing of our bodies for your service and bless those hands that so diligently prepared it. We're so thankful for it, Lord. And, and Lord, tonight as you have uh, brought us to this place and we have fellowshiped and we have uh, just had a good time already, we bring before you our concerns and, and you have heard our cries, you have heard our prayers, you have heard our concerns as well as our joys. So we bring all of these before you tonight and we ask, Lord, that you administer unto each and every Every person, dear Lord, each and every situation, Lord, um, whether it be a physical healing, an emotional healing, or, or, or a spiritual healing, Lord, we, we bring it before you. And there are many unspoken requests here tonight, and we lift one another up. We ask, Lord, now that you would bless our time in your word. We pray that you give us ears to hear, that you would give us understanding, and help us, dear Lord, to take and apply your word to our everyday lives that we might be able to share your goodness and mercy and grace with all the world. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I'm done. It's up to you now. Jeez. I want to raise. <laughs> all right. Uh, Micah, the book of Micah. Uh, we started it last week, and it got so good with some good stuff that we never finished it. So we've got to go backwards a little bit. Uh, bring you back up to speed. We're in the Minor Prophets. We've been in it for, gosh, six to eight weeks now, maybe. Somewhere along that line. So we're kind of working our way through it. And uh, last week we, were, we started Micah. And does anybody remember what we talked about with him? What, who was his prophecy against? Anybody? We're not making an impact. Who is his prophecy against? I don't know. Oh, jeez. <laughs> okay. All right. That makes sense. Um, I wouldn't hear either. There, Micah is, just to give you a back brief on it, uh, he's painting a very dark picture of the time of Judah and Israel. Remember the uh, Hebrew children have split off. There's two different kingdoms. Uh, there's the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of Judah. It all had to do with one of them wanted uh, a king at a certain point in time everybody couldn't agree so they decided to go their separate ways and set up their own kingdoms uh, so the problem is is they have gotten to a point to where their worship is no longer about God they're just going through the motions we've heard this before uh, in several of the other prophets they they've turned to where the rich are getting richer the poor are getting poorer and they're even oppressing one another to just make themselves better in life. Does it, it seems like an ongoing theme from... Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, God's, uh, 
God gives Micah these words. He starts calling them, uh, calls out Israel for their sins or their people completely. Uh, he speaks about that he's going to destroy their cities and leave nothing but rubble. Uh, basically, he's talking about the exile that will come. They will be taken captive and they will be shown who is in charge, who is wealthy, and who is able to take care of one another. Um, they've got religious infidelity going on. They have economic injustice. Uh, like I mentioned, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. Uh, the problem also with this is their uh, elders, their preachers, their prophets, they are all got into false preaching. Uh, they got into the feel-good sermons, but so to speak. They're going to tell you the good stuff and say, oh, God's not going to bring judgment. Oh, you're, you're good to go. Now pay me money. As long as they were getting paid the right amount, they were going to tell you what they wanted to hear. If you failed to feed them or failed to offer uh, part of the sacrifice to them to where you could feed them, they're not going to give you the feel-good words. They'll, they'll start praying that judgment will come upon you. So that became a mainstay. Uh, they wasn't giving words of hope, words of God. It was uh, tickle your ears and make you feel good about yourself. Kind of sounds familiar to something going on today if you're not careful. Uh, they had unjust leaders. Uh, there was no justice for anyone. It depended on how much money you had of what you got away with. If you could pay the leaders off, then you could do whatever. If you had no money to pay, they would just come take your land. Uh, they were running the poor off of their land, which was, goes against the uh, Levitical law. Each, each tribe, each person out of each tribe, uh, when they went into the promised land, they were promised so much acreage. So much of their land became their family's land. Well, that became a mainstay of where, well, you can't pay me what you owe. Get off of it. It's mine now. So they were ever expanding. The wealth just kept growing. They just started taking other people's land. Oh, gosh, I got a it, lot of it, notes here. It wasn't just either. It, it, just, it wasn't just society. It, it was also within the church. And that, that was even, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, so they, they were going and doing the religious festivals, as Chris has kind of done mentioned, they would like go to church on Sunday, uh, maybe go to Wednesday night Bible study, but they had no heart for people. You know, they were just going through the motions of religious observances, but yet there was no real relationship with the Lord. True. Yeah. And what happens with that? Morality starts fading. Yeah. Uh, where you're not uh, subjected to God's law anymore. Uh, you go to be seen. You go to where the elder sits there and goes, hey, I saw you today, Paul. Glad you showed up for church. Yep. Now I'm going to go run somebody off this land and I'm going to take it. Yeah. Uh, Mike even talked about it. There were people who would dream it up during the night of what they were mm -hmm. going to do the next day and they would go through with it. They were the worst of the worst because they didn't have any conscience about taking other people's property. Um, Mike even comes out and he says, all of y'all, the spirit's gone from you. But he, has, he is spirit-filled and the power of God is with him, so he has the right to speak about these things. Because there were prophets saying, don't listen to Micah. He don't know what he's talking about. God's not going to bring judgment on us. We're his chosen people. What could he possibly do? But Michael's like, or Micah is telling him, just hang on. You're going to go to exile and you're going to lose everything. Everything you've ever owned, everything you see here, it's not going to be yours anymore. You're going to go back to being slaves. And, and that's when he kindly brought them to that place where we probably ended last week, um, what the Lord requires. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's kind of where we left off last week, wasn't it? Do y'all remember what the Lord requires? Well, let's, let's jump right into that okay. and go from there. Let's go to chapter 6, yeah. starting with verse 6. Neither. Wait a minute. Look, I've been teaching all day long, so this, I'll be book, glad this book is laid out different. <clears throat> anyway. I, I, I'm in the... Uh, uh, go to verse 8, my bad, not verse 6. I, I'm in the Living Bible, and uh, so uh, so I'll, I'll be reading out of my Living Bible, Life Application Bible, but I'll read verse 8. Um now you better read it and then okay. let me read it out of this one. Out of the NIV, uh, yeah, uh, chapter 6, verse 8, he says, He has shown you, O mortal, or O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, 
and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Now let me give you my translation. He has told you what he wants, and this is all it is, to be fair and just and merciful and to walk humbly with your God. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Continue on. The, that is the three things that God has asked of his people to do. Uh, walking, ju walking justly, to act justly, treat each, each other in the same manner as you treat uh, your own family. Uh, treat your brothers down the street the same way you treat your next door neighbor. Uh, treat uh, one another with, with grace. Love one another. Basically, you, you, nobody has a different position. You look at each other as being a work of God. Uh, just like we are uh, formed in the image of God, he's trying to remind them, so are these people. Uh, just because they live on that side of the tracks doesn't mean they're any less. You have to treat them the same. You don't get special treatment with the law just because you live over here and they live over there. Everybody's the same. You have to look at it that way. Uh, then he's talking about giving, loving mercy. In other words, people do us wrong all the time. And they were even having times where people were doing them wrong, and they showed no mercifulness. Uh, in other words, bring the hammer down on them. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm going to do whatever. I'm not going to forgive those slight imperfections that somebody may have and love them the way God wants me to. I'm going to sit there, and I just I, I want them wiped off. And then walking humbly with God, true relationship. True understanding that God's in charge. Having that, we'll talk about it later, having that trust that God is, is in control and in span instead of uh, me trying to work it out myself and creating these issues. Got anything? Yeah, I, I, just, I just want to kind of mention that God wanted the people to... Show the other nations who he is. Yeah, and, and, <clears throat> and the way they had been living, it was a bad example, a poor mm -hmm. example. It goes back to the church today. If you and I claim to be Christian, um, how, how do we define it? What does it look like? Well, we know that Christians are supposed to be like Christ. And our moral living, our attitudes, uh, the way we treat one another, uh, should be a reflection of who Christ is. And their reflection of who their God was, was very unjust. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, that's one of the biggest reasons judgment was coming upon them. Mm -hmm. Not just for the fact that their worship was in vain, but they had basically turned their back to God, and there again. was no again, and there was no characteristics of godly living. Mm -hmm. When when we talk about the righteousness of God, and we talk about uh, being righteous, we talk a lot about Christ. We 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 become righteous because of what Christ did for us. But righteous living is right living. It's living right according to the law of God. And sometimes we don't talk about that. We, we talk about what Christ has done for us. We talk about the righteousness of Christ. But if, if we have experienced the transformation, the new birth, if we're walking in the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God is going to lead us to right living. Mm -hmm. And that was not there. No, not at all. And that's the reason that uh, the Lord spoke, and he says, this is what I require of you, mm -hmm. right living, which included, you know, being merciful, being just, um, and, and walking humbly with God. So. And they were, they were to be a lot to the other nations, for these other nations to understand who God is as the one true God. Uh, if you go back in Levitical law, remember, they could, they could have outsiders come in and be followers of God. Now, they wouldn't be uh, the chosen Israelites, but there were many people who came and followed their ways. Uh, fast forward 700-something-plus years, and you're going to see uh, that Roman uh, centurion 
who very knew very well, I believe his name was Jarius, he knew what the Jews did. He followed their laws. Mm -hmm. He followed their prayers. He, he became to understand who God was, but even though he was Roman, by the way people lived. So that's what, what God was even wanting here, but they wasn't even given that example. Uh, he starts calling out their sins in, in verse 9 of what I, I expected these things of you, to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with me, but here's what you're doing. You, you're gaining ill-gotten treasures. You're stealing from one another. You're, whatever you have, you didn't, you didn't go get it uh, uprightlessly. You didn't go out there and, and earn it, so to speak. You just took it. Uh, you're, you're deceiving people. Uh, you've got dishonest scales. That was a big thing. Mm. The dishonest scales. Uh, do y'all remember the old scales where you weigh, where they'd bring crops in and you'd put weights on it and that's how they would do it? Well, they had, many people had these ways of creating the weights to where it looked like it said five pounds, but it may only weigh one. So when you threw your sheaves of wheat up there or your basket, they're not going to pay you for the full price of it, but yet they're gaining it, and then they're turning around and selling it to somebody else that doesn't have a dishonest scale. That's, that's the, they used to do that in uh, gas stations when you got gas. Uh, you would only be getting eight-tenths of a gallon, and they would be saving two-tenths of a gallon, but you'd be paying for ten-tenths. You'd yep. be paying for a gallon, and you'd be getting yep. shorted two-tenths. And then you're wondering, man, I just filled up the other day. Yeah. <clears throat> but what they were doing is they were stealing. That was a way of stealing from the poor because most of the poor were farmers. They were bringing in their crops. They were bringing in all their things, and they're hoping to make money. They're like, man, I had a great crop here, but I have nothing to show for it. But yet the mm -hmm. sellers, they were, they were growing in their wealth. They also, uh, he was telling them, um, y'all got problems with violence. Y'all are violent to one another, violent to other nations. Uh, Y'all are constantly lying to each other. And you also have problems with your deceitful tongues. Uh, you say blessings out of one side of your mouth and the other side you say curses. I think uh, James talks about that in some mm -hmm. of his writing, having a two-tongue system. So when God starts calling that out, he goes, you're not living up to anything that I've asked you to do. And so he, he starts calling for a punishment for him, And his punishment's pretty wicked here. He said, verse You're, 13, yeah. and starts he said, verse 13. you are not going to hide from me. You cannot hide from God's punishment. That's even today. Can we hide from God's punishment no. in any way? No, just when you think you've covered yourself in the covers under the bed, you know, he's under there with you. Hello. <laughs> you can't run away from me. But he said, you're going you're gonna to experience destruction and ruin for your sins. Uh, he's still, we're talking about the exile. You're, everything you've got is destroyed. It's going to be ruined. Don't think anything's going to be saved over it. Uh, you're going to eat. You're going to have a time when you're going to eat, and you're not going to be satisfied. You'll be hungry. Uh, you're going ha to save things, and you're going to think, I'm, I'm saving it to, for a better day, and I'm going to have it. No, nope, it's going to be t stolen and taken away. Your sins have brought you to this point to where you're going to see what suffering really means. Uh, you're going to go out and you're going to till the crops. You're going to till the land. You're going to plant your seed. And you're going to be like, I'm going to have a good year. Fields are going to be empty. Mm. Nothing's going to grow. Uh, you're going to have plenty of oil. You're going to have plenty of olive oil. Olives, you're going to squish it. You're going to sit there and draw the oil from it. But there's not going to be any to even put in a jar. You're going to go harvest grapes. You're going to sit there and get ready to make wine. But there's not going to be any. He's letting them know that their way of life and all these luxuries they've had is going away. They're going to be dependent during the exile of the Babylonian king to make sure that they're being taken care of. And they're, God's basically, he's not saying I'm turning a blind eye to you. He's like, you've got to understand I'm going, I'm going to have to bring you back to me some way. I've got to clean you up. And that was the whole purpose yes. for uh, the chastisement. Now, we have, we have to remember that. When, when God's chastising his people, it's always for restoration. Mm -hmm. it, it's not because he don't love them, but he just don't, he don't want to see them destroyed by their own sin. And he's that way with us. Um, you know, when, the, when we come under conviction of the Spirit of God, when, when we've... When we've not done or we have done something that is against the will of God and our, our conscience knows it 
and the Spirit of God speaks to our hearts. When we come under conviction of the Spirit of God, it's to bring us back. Mm -hmm. It's to cause us to see our sin, acknowledge our sin, repent of our sin, and turn back to God. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that is, it's always the same in the Scriptures. And that's what God's doing. He's trying to get them to come back to him rather than to push them away and say, I'm done with you. Yeah. And, and in this time, they're, they're understanding what Mike is saying. But again, you still have these people that say, don't listen to him. The, the, God's not going to judge you. Uh, 700 some odd years later, Jesus quotes Micah in one of his messages. Uh, in chapter 7, verse 6 there. This is, what, this is what Jesus says, and even Micah says it here. It says, for a son dishonors his father. There's going to be conflict. Uh, family units are going to break up. A daughter rises up against her mother. A daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Mm -hmm. And a man's enemies are the members of his own household. God's going to create schisms within to, to clean them up. Jesus there was talking about following him and also trying to follow the ways of the world. There's going to be conflict within the house. Yeah. And he's proving that the Father is God, and we're all brothers and sisters, and we're all together in this. Instead of, I'm, I'm a Christian, you're a Christian, but I'm going to treat you totally different than what I need to. Right. You're not a Christian, and I'm going to treat you totally different, because it's all about me. Where God is saying, it's all about him. him. That's the problem that the, the Israelites here had fallen into, like they have many times before, it turned into about them rather than God. Exactly. And, and they had even gotten to the point where they were following these other heathen gods and expecting God to act the way the heathens were saying their gods did. That, that's where Omri comes, Omri, Omri comes into uh, that next verse. I, I think we hadn't even got there yet. But he had, he had brought the people into idol worship and pagan mm -hmm. worship, and that's where some of that come from. But the great thing is, is Micah doesn't end with just destruction. Yeah. He offers some hope. Uh, that's one of the good things about the prophets. They offer hope in some way. I'm going to bring you doom and gloom, but let me give you a little bit of hope to what to look for. Ma Micah 7 is where we really get into the hope yep. side of things. This is, this is what Micah says. He says, but as for me, all this stuff is going to happen, all this destruction, all this uh, where we're going to be ruined, where the cities will be in rubble, where even just thickets are going to grow on top of, of Samaria. Micah says, but as for me, I watch and hope for the, war, the Lord. I wait for my God, my Savior, and my God will hear me. No matter how far they may be dragged out in exile away from the promised land that they were given, God still hears them. He still hears their cries. He's, he's offering them a hope that it, they can pray and pray, and God's going to hear them, but it's got to be fervent prayer. It's got to be true heartfelt prayer, just not that I'm inconvenienced today because I was taken from my home. Uh, they spend many, many years in Babylonian exile because he's got to clean their minds up. It's uh, not as bad as walking around 40 years in the desert to try to get rid of a generation that can never enter the promised land, but they spend some time in exile. That's right. So moving on into, into verse 7, it says, God's righteousness, his love, and his faithfulness will forgive and renew his people. Michael tells, Micah tells him, God is this way. This is what God is. He doesn't change. He ha offers righteousness. He has his love and his faithfulness will never go away. He's going to forgive and renew us. Um, he reminds them that God's people can trust him for salvation. Mm. Micah says, when he says that, I watch and hope for the Lord. I wait for my Savior. My God will hear me. He's going to hear me and deliver me from wherever I'm at. It may not be today, but I trust my God will, is going to do that. That was kind of our theme last night yes. in the Polygon meeting. Yes. It was a great meeting. Too bad you ladies couldn't be there. Yeah, it, was, it, was, it was good. <laughs> great night. Good. But he te again, Micah tells them, the repentant people, better days are ahead. Don't, don't lose sight. There's, there's a remnant that even mm -hmm. Micah talks about, those that uh, have stayed steadfast and true to God and following his law and his providences and graces. They're going to be taken too, but he's reminding them, look, we're going to be fine. 
We're repentant. God's going, he's going to offer us salvation. There's better days ahead. The Lord is going to be our lot during all this mess. Darkness is not going to befall, befall us. The Lord has always been before us. He will bring us into the light and we will see his righteousness and understand who he is to bring righteousness to ourselves. Um, he brings hope for the restored Israel. It's all going to come back together. We just have to trust. You, you know, and I think one of the things that he was pointing out there too is that, uh, I, I think it's in verse 9, but he, he's basically saying, you know, we're being punished for our sins. Mm hmm I mean, we, we got just, ourselves here. We get, we're, we're the ones that got ourselves to this point. Now, God is bringing, he's restoring us, but through this restoration, it's painful upon us because it, of, of what our sins, we're reaping what we have sown. Mm -hmm. But God will be fair and just, and because we are God's people, he will bring us to a place of restoration. Sometimes we need a whipping to recalibrate us. Gosh. Mm. Jack Chafin recalibrated me a lot as a child. Yeah. <laughs> I, some of you in here may not have got spankings when you were growing up. I, I lived in an era where they were spankings. Um, so I would get a spanking and that spanking was my of the way of getting me to change my behavior and walk in the will of my parents. Mm -hmm. It worked. Oh, definitely. It worked. Yeah, I know. There's different ways of changing a person's will. Uh, I know that everybody has different ways of uh, punishing their children or correcting their children. God, he corrected his children. Uh, I, I call it spanking, but it might not really been a spanking. It was just a, uh, they got things taken away from them. They got their Nintendos taken away from them. They, they learned their reliance was not on their self, but on God. Yeah. He knew what was best. Mm -hmm. And this was his expectations. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Micah goes on and he promises that there will be judgment against God's enemies. God, mm -hmm. God always takes care of his people. Uh, what does the Bible say? It says uh, that uh, vengeance is the Lord's. It's not mm -hmm. ours to take. Yeah. So we, sometimes you just got to sit back and wait and let him do his work. But he goes on in the last part of that chapter. He says, the, incompar uh, the incomparable God of patience, mercy, compassion, and faithfulness will forgive and renew his people. Mm -hmm. Uh, he, he's telling us what God's attributes are. God never changes. God's always been like this and will always be like this. What um, verse you in there? Uh, that's about in verse 18. Yeah, that verse 18, 19, and 20 is yep. my, my I, I like those three passages right there. Uh, one, of the, one of the verses there, verse 18, it starts out, Who is a God like you? This is what Micah is saying about God. He says, You're a God who pardons sin. And forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance. You do not stay angry forever. Oh, there's been times I thought God is just angry all the time with me. But he never has. He's always brought me back to a point to where he's letting me know, I'm not angry, I love you, and I'm trying to fix you. But he goes on and he tells them, he says, the Lord delights to show mercy. God, you will always have compassion on us. When I wrote this out, I put on me. Yeah. You will always tread on our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. You will be faithful to Jacob and show love to Abraham as you pledged on oath to our ancestors in days long ago. Mm. He goes back to talking about the covenants he had with the elders of, of this nation. God's covenant, he never broke it. It was the people who broke the covenant with God. Amen. And so he's, God's never changed. He sees sin, he forgives sin. Mm -hmm. Great thing about him is he forgets it. Yeah. He just keeps growing you. And then he, he doesn't stay angry forever, and he has mercy on us. I, thank goodness we have a merciful God, because mm -hmm. think back to the time of wandering in the uh, desert of the days when 20,000 people were just swallowed up in a hole because he got mad at them. Yeah. You know, think about the, the days you screw up at work, wherever <laughs> you're out and about, and then <laughs> There's a lightning bolt come down and take you out. You know, luckily the Lord has mercy on us of where he's like going, 
You say something to somebody and you're getting in your car and you're still fuming and you start driving down the road and then the Lord says, hmm, shouldn't have said that, should you? And you're like, no, <laughs> do I go back? And, and, and just think about the patience of God. Uh, you know, sometimes we, we think our patience is tested and tried with our children or grandchildren or, or, or whatever, but, but God is so much more patient than you and I. Uh, and why is he patient? Uh, so that he, he desires that we all come to repentance, mm -hmm. that we all come to know his mercy and to know his grace. Um, and and this, this text where, where it talks about forgiveness and all, I, I go back to one of my favorite passages of Scripture in the New Testament, and it's in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. I, I use it a lot. I quote it a lot. It's one of my go-to verses. But that verse says, if you confess your sins, mm -hmm. confession is very important. If you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. That's our hope, you know. Uh, when when it, it's it's the same thing that he's saying here. Uh, Micah is testifying that God is compassionate. He is merciful. Uh, he may try to get our attention uh, because of our sins. He may want to get us to a place to where we can acknowledge those, as I mentioned this while ago, and make confession of our sins because he really wants us to repent. He wants us to turn from our sins and follow after him and pursue him and come back into the right relationship. Why? Because that's why he created us, mm -hmm. to be in a relationship, to be in a right relationship with him. And... Uh, we know that the body of Christ, the church today, uh, we're the hands and we're the feet of Christ. So just like um, they were in Old Testament, the Hebrew children, uh, the children of Abraham, they, they were to share the love and the grace and the mercies of God, but yet they wouldn't do in that. And that's what the church is called to do. We're, we're called to do that today. We're to be the hands, the feet, the mouthpiece of God, of Christ, led by the Spirit of God. And so for me, when we look at this uh, passage here, that's that hope that we find in many of our, our uh, prophets there. Mm -hmm. That finishes Micah. Thoughts, comments on any of, any of the Micah stuff? Okay, y'all got it all then. Good. I guess so. All right. Yeah. Next book. Nahum. Nahum. This uh, book here is a little different than the other prophets that we have seen. There's no hope. Uh, because Nahum's prophecy is not to the children of Israel, not to God's people. Not a call of repentance. It's not a call of repentance. <laughs> it's a call of destruction. Uh, Nahum's main... It's Nahum, coming and you're going you're to get it. That's what it's saying right here. <laughs> Nahum name, Nahum's name means comfort and encourage. Completely the polar opposite of what his prophecy is about. Um, go ahead. S set the stage, though. Let, let them know... Okay. What, what the context Israel is. Israel yeah. and Judah have been besieged by the Assyrian Empire. Mm -hmm. uh, they are now vassal states. They, they basically were overran and overtaken. Uh, they've lost all of their, uh, so to speak, specialness. Mm -hmm. uh, the Assyrians are gloating it over them that we have defeated the Israel. Uh, we've defeated Judah, the line of Judah. We are now in control. We're in charge. They're being oppressed. Uh, this is taking place somewhere between uh, 700, 600 B.C. And a lot of this has to do with taking place in a city known as Nineveh. Where did we hear that word before? We did a study. Jonah. 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 
This takes place about a hundred years after Jonah's prophecy to Nineveh. Very important. What happened in Nineveh when uh, Jonah went there? Everybody repented. A hundred percent. And Nineveh is the capital of Assyrian. Yep, Assyria. Yep. Yeah, Assyria. And Assyria is the, the world power. You know, they're the Rome during that yep. day. Uh, Assyria was the strongest, mightiest army around at that moment in time. And uh, so when you think about this, uh, Jonah, when he went, that city has revival, right? Nineveh has revival. You would think, since it's the capital city, it would also affect and grow out of and grow out of the capital city, right? But a hundred years later, now then God is going to destroy Nineveh because of their sinfulness and what they have done to Israel and Judah. So yeah. Nahum. Uh, I won't go into a lot of detail in this because it's basically he's detailing out of what God's wrath is going to be upon these people. Uh, he's going to strike down their families, their homes, their herds, their cattle. Their king may think that he is going to hide, but he will strike the king down. All of the king's court, all of the king's family, they will be wiped off the planet and nobody will even hear of them anymore. Uh, in other words, there's no bloodline of the Assyrians anymore. The Lord's going to wipe them out. Uh, but in the middle of all this, he's also telling them that uh, this is kind of like a cheerleading piece to the people of Judah. Yeah. Uh, in the middle of his doom and gloom, Nahum offers hope to the children of, uh, of Judah. The Assyrians is persecuting Judah. The Assyrians is persecuting God's people which is part of the uh, punishment that God allows mm -hmm. upon them. So this hope that's going to come now to Judah and the Israelites, um, that word, that comforter, when you mm -hmm. said a while ago about his name, that it is comforting to the Israelites, God's people, that their oppressors is fixing to be demolished. Exactly. Yeah. And Assyria has the largest army. Yeah. They have the strongest warriors. People fear them everywhere. And Micah basically tells them, it doesn't matter how big they are, doesn't matter how much people they have, the Lord is a greater warrior than they are. Mm -hmm. he, he can stand up to them all. But in, in verse 1, chapter, or, yeah, chapter 1, verse 7, it's been a long day, y'all. Um, this is what Nahum says in the middle of his prophecy of destruction. He said, the Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble, and he cares for those who trust in him. Uh, this was the basis for the Polygon meeting last it night. It was, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The, that is a very strong word of hope that Nahum gives. Uh, the people of Judah, they've been oppressed for so long. And when he says this, he's telling them, Look, the Lord's always been good to us in times of trouble. I looked up tr the word trouble and they went back to the Hebrew and? of that one. And? It was about this long explaining what that word trouble could, could mean. It could be calamities, health issues. It could be to where they were having financial issues. Uh, you name it, any type yeah. of trouble, that was what that encompassed. That in what I got out of that is how that word is used in all them different ways that God's always good even in that time. Yeah. Uh, we forget sometimes that God is, we kind of put him at a distance if we're going through something. Mm -hmm. But God is always good even in those troubling times. Oh, yeah. But then it goes on and he says, he cares for those who trust in him. So I have a question for y'all tonight. How hard is it to trust God? We answered this question last night in the Polygon meeting, but for you ladies that wasn't attending, how hard is it to trust God sometimes? Mm, yeah. When, when the Lord sits there and says to you, I need you to go do this, 
Do you sit back and go, uh, Lord, how about a little bit more information? How about uh, you might need to send me to a class for that? How about uh, can, you, can you broaden that aspect a little bit, maybe send me an email outlining the details of what exactly you're wanting me to do, how you're wanting it done, and what the end result needs to be? And then what, am I, how much am I responsible for what's, what's going on where, he's, where he just wants to say, go? It's just like the word from the Sunday sermon, follow. The Lord says, go. Do we just get up and go? Do we trust him enough to go? And we talked last night, and this, this is a good point for us to be mindful of this. Everything that, that we do is based on faith. We're faith walkers. Mm -hmm. uh, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. We talked about it last night, though, about this trust and faith, trust and faith. Uh, one of my favorite stories in the Bible about trust and faith is the story of Abraham. Mm -hmm. Because when you go back and you, you study that and you look at Abraham's life, when, when God spoke to Abraham, he said, Abraham, I want you to pack up your bags and I want you to go and I'll show you the place that I want you to go to. He, he leaves his father. He leaves his homeland. He leaves everything he knows and trusts his God to show him where he's going to go. There's no map. There's no plan. No itinerary. There's no itinerary. And, and for me, that's one of the, the greatest faith stories in the scriptures for me. Because of that, it's a day-by-day -day walk, a day-by-day -day trust in the Lord. And, and, and I think that's pretty much the way we operate in reality. Um, you, you may have some laid-out details to your life and your walk with the Lord, but uh, I find that most days, every day's a new day with the Lord, and, and, and I really don't know what I'm going to be doing from one day to the next. And everything that I do, it's basically going mm -hmm. and trusting and believing and uh, that God's going to give words to speak when I get there. And sometimes I don't even know where I'm going to go. So I, I think that's our faith journey. And, and that gets back to, to this thought here. Um, the people of God was in much trouble. Very much trouble. But God's good. Uh, but God's good. Even He's in compassionate. Trouble. Even in trouble. And He's merciful. still the same. Yes. But sometimes we don't look at God in the midst of our trouble. We look mm -hmm. at the trouble yep. rather than God. There was a song the kids sang years ago in the vacation Bible school. God is bigger than the boogeyman. So would you, you give that? us a verse? I don't uh, No, I don't even remember how it goes. But I, I remember the words that God is bigger than the boogeyman. And I remember asking, well, what is the boogeyman? And the kids, you know, they would explain it was all these different things. It wasn't the scary th thing in the closet or under the bed. It was anything that scares us and troubles us. Yeah. Saying God's bigger than that. God is good. Yeah. Where the troubles may be bad, but God stays the same. He's right there with us. And, it, and he's, we have to trust that he is there with us. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, he, I'm, I'm having so much trouble, he, not, he must not be with me, where we need to be trusting that he's going to get us to the other side. We have that hope that he's always with us. Mm -hmm. We have that um, feeling of love that's always with us, that he's got our best interests at heart. He may be trying to show us something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Trouble. Trouble. Trouble and trust. I'm sorry for, for sidetracking you there. All right. You got anything else on that? Not right there. Okay. Well, where you got, because that's about where I was able to finish prepping. Well, uh, <laughs> it's 724. Uh, I, it might be a good place for us to, to kind of, you know, wind down. Uh, just remember, if you go back, there's, there's only three chapters here. It's very short. It, very short. So... Just remember when you read this that God's people is under severe persecution. They're, they're troubled. 
They're in the midst of their trouble, but God is going to overcome the enemy. And that's their hope. That's their comfort. Mm -hmm. Even though they've got to go through this, they know that they are going to be delivered. God will be there at the end. God will be there at the end. And sometimes you and I just have to go through stuff. You know, God, God don't always take us out of our trouble. You can't live on the mountain forever. No. And some of you, I mean, I know some of your story right now, and I know you've been through some troubles. Going back to however you want to define it, whether it's a health issue, financial issue, family, family issue, you know, whatever it might be. We've all had our trouble, maybe in the midst of our troubles right now. But the comforting thought is, is that God is with us in the midst of our trouble. And that God will see us through the troubles. And He will establish us on the other side. Never forget that. That is so important. Because we have to be able to see that God is working for us and not against us. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you all for being with us tonight. Glad to see you, everybody. Y'all are a good-looking group. Yeah, Eric smiled. <coughs> Lee 